Good afternoon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are about to start the session. It's starting late because uh, the last session came out late. So can we make this? I mean, this is a huge room. We do look like little dots. So let's make it a little bit more intimate and move in uh, a little bit further. Eh? Yeah. That way we can have a better galvanization. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I'm going to introduce to you our, our honorable chairperson. Uh, Carol Awina, who is, um, she talked about herself, but all I know is that she's one of my role models and a member of PAPWIC, the Pan-African Positive Women's Coalition, our own indigenous African women uh, movement of women living with HIV who are really going to turn this epidemic around and make sure that we see the end of AIDS. Thank you very much, Carol, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you, Sheila. I wanted to start by acknowledging um, the disaster that happened where we lost uh, our colleagues. I would like us to remember throughout this conference our colleagues who died on their way to Melbourne. Let us carry the bright flame of their memory and celebrate their lives. The best way we can do this is to celebrate their life, is to achieve their dreams that they so much fought for that they actually in the end died for. So welcome to this panel discussion. And this discussion brings a debate around positioning AIDS in the post-2015 development agenda, including how to mobilize civil society and create political incentives for renewed leadership in order to secure global commitment to ending the AIDS epidemic as a public threat by 2030. It is now 14 years since the MDGs were formulated. We, the players in the, H, in the HIV and TB, endeavor to achieve MDG 6, which seeks to, speaks to combating HIV AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. And as we know now, the main one of those diseases is tuberculosis. And that is to halt and begin to reverse the spread of HIV AIDS and begin to reverse the incidence of malaria and other diseases, which, like I said before, in this case, mainly tuberculosis. We know we have almost attained the mark. Despite unprecedented progress, AIDS is far from over. We must not rest. We must not be complacent. We must ensure to tackle HIV and tuberculosis if we are to win the fight. There is a saying, an adage, that goes that just when clouds are darkest, comes the sun in brightest rare. We are now in the last leg towards eliminating AIDS. Our goal is near. The post-2015 agenda presents a unique opportunity to step up the pace and secure a global commitment to ending AIDS by 2030. This can be a milestone to the three zeros, AIDS, around AIDS, TB, and malaria and will be critical for continued visibility and support. We are aware there are a lot of competing priorities in most nations, and AIDS risks getting lost in the crowded post-2015 agenda. So my call here is that Melbourne deliberations can be the spark to ignite a global movement for ending AIDS and leaving no one behind. I'm sure for those who are at the opening ceremony, you heard Michelle speak a lot about that. And then also during the opening ceremony last night, there was a lot of mention about engaging the people living with HIV themselves at, at all levels. And the motto for people living with HIV and AIDS is nothing for us without us. Inclusion at every level is important if you are to win. For me, that part is very important as a woman living with HIV my, myself. We've been talking about in fully engaging people living with HIV and AIDS from the start. Every conference we talk about the same thing. I'm hoping that from Melbourne, there's going to be a change of fully engaging people living with HIV. To avoid, getting, uh, to avoid AIDS getting lost, the AIDS community must demonstrate the catalytic uh, potential of AIDS for health and development, investing in AIDS in an investment of, in social justice. With us this afternoon is a team of brilliant minds, people that I've worked with uh, for many years, who will lead us in discussions on how we should not be complacent in the fight against HIV and TB. We have with us uh, Dr. Festus Mohaye, 
who is the former president of the Republic of Botswana and is the chairman of Champions for an HIV-free generation. Uh, Dr. Muhaye has won international praise for his efforts to combat the HIV epidemic in Botswana. He is uh, the commissioner for UNAIDS Lassent and Global Commission on HIV and Law. And in August 2008, during the 17th International AIDS Conference, Dr. Muhaye launched the Champions for a Free HIV Generation, a group of former African presidents and other influential personalities aimed at mobilizing high-level leadership for renewed and revitalized re responses to HIV and AIDS in Africa. So could we please welcome uh, Dr. Mahaya. Yes. We also have Michelle Sidibe, who is the Executive Director of UNAIDS and Under Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations. Under his leadership, UNAIDS works to ensure that everyone in need of access to life-saving HIV services uh, gets them. He initiated the global call to eliminate HIV infections among children and keep their mothers alive. Mr. Sidibe has spent more than 30 years in, in public service. He has been awarded honorary doc doctorates from several leading universities, as well as an honorary professorship at Stellenbosch. In 2012, he was named as one of the, the 50 most influential Africans by the Africa Report, and also one of the 50 personalities of the year by the French newspaper Le Monde in 2009. Let's welcome Michel Sedibe. We also have Mike Daibo, who is the executive director of the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Mark has worked on HIV and public health for more than 25 years as a clinician, scientist, teacher, and administrator. He became a founding architect and driving force in the formation of the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, better known to most of us as PEPFA. After serving as Chief Medical Officer, Assistant Deputy and Acting Director, he was appointed as its leader in 2006, becoming the US Global AIDS Coordinator with the rank of ambassador at the level of an Assistant Secretary of State. Let's please welcome Mark. <laughs> Last but not least, we have uh, my sister, Yvonne Chaka Chaka, somebody I've worked with very closely over the years. Yvonne Chaka Chaka, though most of us know her as a musician, is the Roback Malaria Goodwill Ambassador, as well as a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador. She is also the MDG Envoy for Africa. And she is also the Nelson Mandela's 46664 Ambassador. She is the first African woman to win the Crystal Awards. And she won this award for using her art to improve the lives of communities and the lives of the poor. She has been in the music industry for over 30 years and has just released her 23rd album. And, and Nelson Mandela duped her Princess of Africa. <laughs> so to start with, I'll ask uh, Michelle Sidibe to take the floor. Michelle. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it is always a pleasure to be in the same panel with uh, my big brother, Mohai, and also my young brother, Mark Debol, and my sister. I want just to say that because uh, this panel list are uh, representative of uh, what we need if we want really to end AIDS, we'll not be able to end AIDS without uh, the activists, people who are coming uh, with a voice, energy, to help us really to push the agenda. We'll not end AIDS also if we don't have uh, uh, people uh, who are coming from uh, a different uh, background, uh, political leadership who could help us uh, to frame uh, the political agenda, to s make it uh, uh, cer certainly uh, relevant uh, to our call. But uh, without the global fund, let us uh, forget about ending AIDS. If we don't have a fully fun global fund, if we don't have a global fund which could help us 
really to accompany and to transform uh, this call into reality uh, by making sure that also it will uh, help the countries to start thinking about uh, a transition uh, from, uh, of course, uh, fully funded programs in country level to share responsibility will not be able to deliver on ending AIDS. That's why I'm very happy to have uh, this panel with activists both sides, with politicians, and also with uh, Mark, which is representing certainly the biggest uh, fund we have in the fight against HIV AIDS. I consider that uh, ending AIDS uh, is an opportunity of uh, a generation. And I think is a marker who told me that one day when we were talking and I asked him, and he said, yes, it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity and we should not miss this opportunity. It could be the biggest uh, victory of the 21st century to say that uh, we have been uh, ending AIDS. We have been able uh, to really give that uh, uh, to the history. And I think um, uh, we are seeing already a positive wave uh, of support uh, for uh, ending AIDS. The Secretary General, you heard, the different uh, big countries were coming. I was in the African Union meeting in uh, Malabo with uh, uh, President Mohai just a few weeks back. Uh, the, pre uh, the African Union were calling for ending AIDS. Uh, Algeria non align uh, for the first time um, uh, a states came together and called for ending AIDS. The civil society organized themselves for calling AIDS. And um, we, we heard yesterday, I was sharing that, the working group in uh, New York also uh, put uh, ending AIDS by 2030 in their agenda and they are sending that to General Assembly for approval. So I think uh, it is a momentum which is here. And this momentum for me is, is uh, very uh, important because by ending AIDS, it's not just AIDS uh, uh, per se. Uh, AIDS is not, uh, we will not end AIDS in isolation. When we talk about ending AIDS, like I said yesterday, we're talking about uh, human rights, how to deal with the barriers, the obstacles which we have. So if we don't remove those obstacles, if we don't change the laws, if we don't work with uh, 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 the environment in which we are uh, operating, we will not be able. But it means also uh, dealing with uh, gender equality. Is, uh, is, is, it means also uh, being able to certainly talk about obstacles we are facing in service delivery and also mechanism of even disbursing resources, how to mobilize private sector, how to change uh, innovation to make sure that we can really be uh, su uh, supporting. I was talking about labs and others, but uh, uh, the advantage of ending AIDS will link us to TB, will link us to maternal health, will link us to uh, violence against women, but also effectiveness of uh, how we use resources, uh, Mark and others will uh, certainly uh, share with the countries. So I, I want to just uh, to say uh, how we can, from my point of view, and is a very humble and uh, 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 reflection, uh, because uh, we need to take more time. But I think the first things we need, four things I'm thinking about. One is the epidemic is different today and uh, will continue to evolve. We are seeing hotspots in different parts of the world. If you look at our GAP report, you will see a major entry point for dealing with the epidemic, but you will see small hotspots in uh, different places. And is, uh, uh, those multiple uh, 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 hotspots Hot spots. If you don't deal with them, you will not be able uh, to really uh, understand uh, the nature of the epidemic. You will not put your resources where uh, epidemic is. You will not put your resources where we are having new infection. You will not put your resources where we have death. So that's the first things which I personally feel is uh, very important uh, to do. So it's. Talking about that it means that we need to think about uh, location and population. That is very important, and the report is showing that very clearly. It's not just about anymore one epidemic 
And uh, then we will uh, be uh, ending this epidemic because we know that we have 35 million people infected. And uh, no, it's very important to pick the uh, population and location and trying to really uh, tailor our response in function of that uh, situation. And if not, uh, we will not be able, it will be a blanket uh, type of standardized uh, response uh, everywhere for everyone. That will, that will not work anymore. I'm convinced on that, and I believe that uh, uh, that will be the way we go. And you heard me saying that uh, 15 countries, if I want, I can even go to 20. 15 countries today, uh, if we pick those 15 countries, including USA, we will have 75% uh, uh, of uh, uh, people living with HIV, 75% of death, 75% of new infection. So it is very important that we can have a catch-up plan if we want to uh, end AIDS. And this catch-up plan will be very critical because uh, how you will deal with Nigeria. You think you will deal with Nigeria with the resources which we have today is impossible. I have the minister of Nigeria here, and we need a very, I will, I will say in some cases, a Marshall Plan to come to work together with Nigeria government resources, with other resources, to make sure that we can really have an impact. If not, we will have a small, small, and we'll be all frustrated, and we'll be all saying after 15 years, oh, we don't see a major impact in Nigeria, we don't see a major impact in DRC, we are not seeing no. So we need to understand uh, the nature of uh, and the size of the magnitude and how we will have to mobilize the resources in the future uh, uh, to be able to address those type of epidemic. I think we have the tool and we, we know what is working today. We have a science, and let uh, people who are more competent than me, like Mark, to talk about that. But I think we can uh, achieve the goal if we are capable to really maximize the use of all of that. And I said yesterday, treatment is a very important tool we have, but we need also to maximize our prevention tools. We need to be able to come with a, a, a goals which will really address also the prevention aspect. We have a huge breakthroughs with a PrEP, with a, a different uh, circumcision and others. We need to know in function of location, population, how we maximize those type of uh, 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 tools we have today. And I want to end by saying that uh, uh, end of AIDS uh, means control, not elimination. Let us be very clear here. We must uh, really make people understanding that when we are talking about end of AIDS, we are talking about controlling AIDS as a public health threat. And for me, that is possible, and uh, it, it will be uh, taking us uh, a different uh, way to work together but we can offer to the world and to our generation uh, the, this uh, gift. By 2030, it's possible to say that we control this epidemic. And we are not anymore scared. It's not anymore an uh, epidemic, but we have cases of HIV and AIDS, but it's not anymore an epidemic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michelle. We've heard from Michelle how there's a call for ending uh, AIDS by 2030. We'll now call upon Dr. Festus Mahaye so that we can hear the African perspective. Dr. Mahaye. Thank you very much, my sister. When my colleagues and I formed the Champions for HIV Free Generation in 2008, we were anxious that the target we set ourselves about the MDGs should be achieved. I'm afraid we are even more anxious today because the target date for the attaining of the MDG, including and especially MDG 6A, 
is next year. And while we, I do not, we do not underestimate the substantial amount of work that has been done and what has been achieved in stabilizing the situation and converting what was a killer disease into a, a chronic one with which one can live. While one doesn't want to deny that and to discourage ourselves, nevertheless, we still have a long way to go because HIV is still with us. Michelle has just pointed out that we need detailed, focused, analytical approach because um, the epidemic is becoming differentiated among countries. Nevertheless, we in Sub-Saharan Africa and we in Eastern and Southern Africa who bear the heaviest burden of disease really have to be up in front. We, we, our concerns are, are as great, if not even greater, because, because of what we have achieved together. By acting together, we have achieved, we have made substantial progress, but that progress is not enough. We have not achieved the end of AIDS. My fear, our fear is that we are behaving as if AIDS came and went, that it is an event that has passed, and yet it is not. It is a long progress. It's a long, it's a long-term fight which we should remain, in which we should remain engaged. We, were, we feel that some of our leaders now feel as if work, work done it has been achieved, now we can go to something else. No, we can't afford to do that. We can't afford to do that. And we have to act together again. For instance, if we hope the international community to continue committed to the Global Fund, we must continue to speak with one voice as Africans as the continent most seriously affected by this epidemic. Because we have to acknowledge that age is global. Uh, right now I'm told uh, by the experts, the two experts between me and my colleagues <laughs> here, how, how age is increasing. Infections are rising very fast in Eastern Europe. But the fact remains that for the present, whatever is happening elsewhere, for the present, we in Sub-Saharan Africa, and in particular Southern and Eastern Africa, we bear the heaviest burden of disease. And we learned at enormous cost in the past because we responded with a very substantial leg. By the time we really brought ourselves up, pulled ourselves by our boots, it was too late in a way. We had lost too many people. But of course, we have made substantial progress and we have achieved much. But although much has been done, much still abides. Some work of noble note has yet to be done. And therefore, we have to continue to fight, to fight for the, the funding of the Global Fund. We have to continue to ask our leaders to talk about AIDS, about the fact that although we have achieved a great progress, we still have a lot ahead of us to be done. Because with AIDS, it's either we contain it effectively, collectively, uh, comprehensively, or if we relax, it raises its ugly head. You know why it started? First, we heard, well, there is a, a funny disease in that country, then that country. Then we said, oh, it is Uganda. Later, it was Botswana. Then another country. Then here, 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 all of us, everywhere. everywhere. If we relax now, before we have really comprehensively contained this epidemic, that's what's going to happen, because new infections, Instead of going down, which, have been, which it has been doing, 
will imperceptibly at first start rising slowly. And before we know it, they, we will be back where we were 20 years ago. And that's desirable. That's undesirable. We cannot afford that to happen. And therefore, we have to really to remain engaged. Uh, and it is for our leaders. Because now we know better. We know what works and what doesn't work. And we know that there is strength in our working together. We know that. And therefore, we should not relax. And therefore, we ought to work even harder because now we know what works and what doesn't work. But we know also the price we paid for acting too slowly in the past, initially. We, this time, it, we can be excused. We will say that we didn't understand this mysterious disease. We didn't realize the harm it would do to us. And we acted perhaps with panic. Perhaps we were too surprised by what was happening. But now we know, we know better. And therefore, if we don't act collectively, effectively, comprehensively, we will be more to blame than was the case in the past. And there is a very great danger of that happening unless we recommit ourselves to end AIDS by 2030. In the new post-2015 development agenda, AIDS should remain one of the major objectives, one of the major MDs to be achieved. Because, you know, in the past, around 2000, AIDS was the equivalent of being, our, being, our position was equivalent to people being shot at with a machine gun. And maybe that's why we realized what was happening and we ultimately reacted uh, together. Now what is happening? It's sniping. People are dying here and there and there and there. And we don't realize it is the same age. And yet it is. And new infections are still taking place, which is unfortunate. One of the things, for instance, which we are to blame is the fact that we have, we have made good progress in the prevention of children being born with HIV. But we could have done better. And we can do better. And we could have done better. Therefore, we are culpable to the extent that uh, mother-to-child transmission is still taking place and, and scale at which it is happening, we are to blame for that. We have no excuse because it's within our competence to prevent that. So those, those are some of the examples that uh, we cannot afford to go to sleep when in fact we are guilty now, right now. We as African leaders are guilty of failing to prevent mother to child transmission. <laughs> guilty because we now have the capacity to do it. Guilty because we now have the capacity to do it. And so those are some of the areas where Without denying what we have done in the past, we must also acknowledge that we could have done better. And we must do better. We must go back to the United Nations. When we go there and insist that AIDS for us is as important, if not so, if not more so than the last time round. Because the last time round, in any case, when we said that we should contain it, we didn't even know whether we'd have the capacity to do so. But now we know what we can do. If we fail to do it now in future, if we fail to do it by 2013, we will fail, we will be directly to blame because we have the capacity to do something 
more meaningful than was the case in the past. Well, really, my colleagues, my sister there, and my brother here have already said things. I'll just be repeating what they have said and what perhaps I have said before too. So let me stop there. Maybe we, we can then discuss later and I can elaborate on some of the points. But I have written, I have written to some of our colleagues who will be representing us at the UN, the president, to beg them. I told them that I write to you with a bent knee and cap in hand to please <laughs> work hard for us and ensure that AIDS is an essential component of the, the post-2015 agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Muhaye. We've heard how uh, HIV is still uh, highest in sub-Saharan Africa. And I'll now call upon uh, my sister, Yvonne Chaka Chaka, who comes from South Africa, and also to talk to us uh, from the perspective of uh, civil society. She's uh, somebody who lives in the community and understands the problem in the community. Yvonne. Thank you, Carol. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. I know everybody will ask, what is a musician doing here? But I use my voice uh, to say whatever I like. <laughs> and I'm very happy that uh, we've got the president. Once a president, always a president. I think I love you even more after listening to you today because um, you have admitted we were a bit slow in Africa. And it's leaders like yourself who take responsibility and you have shown leadership. And I think I love you even more. <laughs> so as a musician and a mother of four boys, I want to say it is imperative that we talk about these things. I'm an African, we have a problem. It's important when we talk about these things, we also talk about communities, because how do you cut my hair without me? So the involvement of communities, it's imperative. Thank you, Michelle, for admitting the problems and the challenges that are there. We've got Mark here today, a fully funded global fund. We've seen the changes. We've seen what the global fund has done to different communities but we can't do it on our own. Science is important. Ordinary people are important. Communities, women in particular, women who cannot even choose what to do, knowing well that your husband is HIV positive, you can't even negotiate sleeping with a condom. That is not fair. We need human rights when we talk about AIDS. How can we combat AIDS? Nelson Mandela in 2004, spoke about how do you combat AIDS if you don't talk about TB. It's 2014, ladies and gentlemen. Forums like this are good, but forums like this need to change lives. We need to start walking the talk and stop blah, 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 because people are dying. And Mr. President, you did say, people are dying everywhere. We can't be pointing fingers. We need to work together. We need to look at a woman or a man holistically. We need a one-stop shop. As a woman, I can't be here, be treated for HIV, then walk 20 kilometers, go and get treatment for TB. We need a one-stop shop. Because you can imagine women will decide to stay at home and die. You've spoken about a prevention. An old saying says prevention is better than cure. Now we need to educate our people. We need to talk to our young people. We need to talk to vulnerable communities because they are there. In different countries, people are being killed. We can't afford that in this day and age because we're all human and we're all equal in the eyes of the Lord. So who are we to judge each other? So let us work together, ladies and gentlemen. We've chosen this path. Let no one turn us around. This war we must win only if we work together. A fully funded global fund is needed. Um, I'd written my notes. And communities, 
really. Communities are more important. And in other countries, you know, or in villages, we need to be talking to our community leaders as well. We can't leave them behind. So if we work together, I think we can really make it. So we can't stop now. I will use my music. I will use my voice to air my views, to say to people out there, we, you are valued. It doesn't matter where you come from, whether you come from a disadvantaged community, whether you come from a rich community, you are valued. People's lives are valued. And our presidents, past and present, we need to talk. We don't, we don't need to hide under the table. I'm actually happy that the president has tackled the bull by the horn and said, yes, we made mistakes, we had challenges, but now we know. We've got resources, we've got the know-how, we need to make sure that uh, by 2015, or maybe by 2030, we talk of HIV as a thing of the past. We cannot afford to have people dying. So with that being said, I want to say to all of you, you are important, you are converted already, you know what needs to be done, but when we all go here, we need to say to ourselves, still so many questions I don't know. Realize the question is how we grow. So I step out of the ordinary. I can feel my soul ascending. I'm on my way, can't stop me now. You can do the same. What have you done today to make you feel proud? Never too late to try. What have you done today to make you feel proud? What have you done today to make you feel proud? Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Yvonne. Thank you. So we've heard Yvonne talking about how it's important for us to work together if we, we are to win, and the inclusion of civil society. But to get all this work done, we need money. And the person who can help us with the resources, I think, is our next speaker, Mike Dybal. Mike, please. Thank you. Um, I, w I would begin by saying the, the, the people who can help us with the resources are the people in this room. Uh, um, and um, uh, but I want to start by saying I'm really angry that I have to talk after um, that ending to Yvonne's comment. <laughs> um, you know, galvanizing uh, a movement is a very difficult thing, especially when a movement's been around for 15 years. Um, and it's a very complicated thing. And, and the, what we've learned, or one of the many things we've learned, I think, is uh, you galvanize a movement by telling a compelling story. And we have quite a story to tell, but it has to be a new live story. You don't galvanize a movement by looking forward, you galvanize a move by looking backward, you galvanize a movement by looking forward. And I worry sometimes that we're stuck too much in looking backward and not enough in looking forward. But it's good to start with looking backward because there was a compelling story and a mo movement was galvanized in 2000, 2001. And we happen to have uh, really one of the greatest heroes in that story, uh, one of the few leaders in the world who stood up and told the story and said, you might all say I can't do this, but I can and will do it. And it was President Mohai who, when everyone said you couldn't do treatment in, uh, in South, Southern Africa or in Africa, went ahead and did it. And that was a really compelling story. And I have to tell you, as PEPFAR was being developed, uh, were it not for Botswana, it would have been awfully hard to do um, because there was a leader who stood up and said, we can do this. <laughs> but when the president took that incredibly visionary and bold move, I remember reading his comments and what he said my, was, my country won't exist uh, if I don't do this. Um, uh, it's a small-ish country, a million two, million point two uh, at the time, uh, and with a 30% infection rate, he wasn't kidding. His country could have ceased to exist. And that was a movement and that was a vision to stop dying, to, as the MDG said, as we heard, to halt 
uh, and begin to reverse and to stop dying. And that's what the science uh, told us could be done then. That's what the understanding at the time told us could be done then. Uh, we are at a different historic moment. That was a hugely historic moment. Uh, and we couldn't be where we are today with that. But now the narrative has changed and the compelling story has changed. One thing about policymakers is they don't tend to want to just do what people have been doing in the past, nor should we be content with doing what we did in the past, as the president said. And the other leader, Michelle Sidibe, has laid forward with UNAIDS the vision, the compelling story for the future, in particular in these current reports and in his comments, which is to take a change in our thinking to not look backward and to keep setting goals in the way we set them in the past, or to keep talking in the way we've talked in the past, but to actually look forward to what is possible today and tell that compelling story. And Michelle gave us that compelling story, and the president talked about it, and Yvonne sang it for us, which is to see an end to HIV as an epidemic, as a public health threat. That is fundamentally different than the historic vision we set a decade and a half ago. And in many ways, it is a more compelling, more exciting vision that can galvanize in an even more exciting way if we get behind that forward vision in an exciting and new way. And we have that now because of advances in science, because of advances in epidemiology, and because of the collective experience of the last 10 years that the president spoke about. So we had a tipping point 10 years ago of, will we let a country die? Will we let tens of millions of people die? We now have a new historic tipping point of, will we end HIV as an epidemic and as a public health threat? <clears throat> Now, tipping points, the thing about tipping points is they can go either way. That's why they're tipping. Uh, we either can use the advantages that we have, use the experience, get the return on the investment, and tip this epidemic down to complete control, or we can stay where we are and watch it tip up. And one point that I think we need to make is the positive, because policymakers do respond to positive. What can you do? What did you come to office to do? What historic thing can you do? But we also need to remind people that they can also be the generation, we can be the generation that for the first time had the opportunity to end this plague, or we can be the generation that lost it. And we know that window isn't very long, and the data tell us that window isn't very long, as we're seeing in countries as rates are going up. If we don't use the technology we have today, if we don't use the epidemiology that we have today, we cannot foresee, if this epidemic starts going up, the ability to get it back under control. So making that compelling positive case with the very clear indication of the compelling negative case and the responsibility for it. But telling a story and telling an opportunity isn't enough. You actually have to prove you can do it. You know, as you walk in, as I'm sure the president often had, you have a 15-minute meeting with a head of state. You tell a story. For the next eight hours, the president has 15-minute increments of people telling stories. And it's usually problems that need to be solved. Very, very rarely do they get the solution. So we have to tell the story of what's possible and tell the story of how we're going to do it and then deliver on it. And what that means concretely, if we're going to sustain financing, either domestically or internationally, is declines in new infection rates. Um, increases in treatment are incredibly important. We need to save lives, and that is happening. And Chris Murray, you know, has just published that 19 million live years have been saved. That's breathtaking. But to be honest, seeing increases in treatment without decreases in infection rates scare policymakers more than just about anything, because that's a long-term budgetary commitment. And so that decline in infections and seeing a decline in infections is what the end of the epidemic is all about, as an epidemic, bringing it under control. That will require quite a few things, and I don't have time, and we don't have time to go into that, but it is going to require something Michelle talked about, which is focus. You know, when the president started, 
Any amount of money spent was going to have massive impact, as was seen in Botswana and many other places. Today, to get that additive benefit, to get that bending of the curve, is going to require very smart, very focused investments, as Michelle said, focusing on where infections are, uh, the location and the population. And that also means uh, focusing our interventions in a way that are responsive to the, the populations and the countries and the epidemics. Uh, there are actually no national epidemics. There are sub-epidemics in each country. And we need to be sophisticated enough to support and have countries have differential responses, as actually Nigeria has begun to do focusing on its 12 states. But we also need to show that we're achieving the results in the most efficient and effective way. And that's where the cascade that we've been seeing, whether it's treatment or implementation, is so important. That we are learning from the past, that we are focusing on quality, that we're delivering results in the most effective way. And that means innovation in how we deliver. We actually have the tools today, but now we need to deliver them in the most efficient way to see the bending of those curves, to see the remarkable decline in infections. So galvanizing a movement is a vision, and it's the leadership to get there, which we have. It's showing that we can achieve that vision, which is dramatic declines in new infections, and that's our responsibility over the next three to five years. And the third component is to show a shared responsibility in that everyone's in the game. And that fundamentally means increased domestic financing. I can tell you absolutely that we will not see increases in, in, in external investments nor will we sustain the current levels, whether it's the global fund replenishment in three years, whether it's not as other bilateral programs next year or the year after, unless we see that decline in infections and unless we see an increase in domestic finance. I can guarantee you that. And so we need to work together to support the ministers of health that are fighting for these increases to ensure that heads of state and ministers of finance are on board and are doing that. And that means involving new actors in a new creative way. You know, to be honest, there's a limited impact that external people have to go into a country. You know, for external people to have gone into President Mohai to say, you need to do this, you need to do this, wouldn't have been very effective. It was President Mohai needing what he needed to do in his country. Same with the leaders in countries today. And it's in a much remarkable uh, ownership stage that we've never been in before. And that means building the constituencies in the countries to pressure governments to spend resources who want to do it. Minister Chukwa wants to spend more money, but he's got a, a fiscal space that he needs to deal with, and he's got a head of state, and he's got a minister of finance, and there are a lot of competing priorities. Governments don't naturally spend more money on things, uh, unless you're a leader like President Mohai. Uh, you need support to do that. That's where the community comes in, and that's where new communities come in. And I want to emphasize, too, that we talk about, but we haven't really done enough to galvanize. And one is the private sector. If you talk to heads of state, if you look at who heads of state bring with them to the General Assembly, it's usually private sector people. They're very focused on jobs. They're focused on economic growth and development because they know that's their engines of growth. Private sector has a disproportionate ability to sway governments to spend more money on social services. And I'm not talking about external, external companies. That's important. In Africa today, in Asia, in, in the Caribbean, there are more domestic companies. There are more powerful domestic private sector people that have that influence. And we need to galvanize them around this historic opportunity to end the epidemic because they'll have a lot more influence with their local governments than anyone externally will have. Same with the communities. Just as increase in financing in the countries in Europe and the United States were driven by the communities, the communities will need to get behind and support, and youth in particular. Uh, if you talk to most heads of state in Africa today, they're pretty worried about youth because 60, 70 percent of their population is young. So they're looking at jobs and economic growth and opportunity and development, and they're looking at young people. And if we can galvanize those two groups, around a message, around results, we will see an end to this epidemic. So um, galvanizing movements are tough, especially when we've been around for a while, but we are in a new moment, and if we're strategic and smart, and if we do and follow the leadership of the past and the leadership of the present that are reflected here today, we'll get there. Uh, thank you.
thank you very much to, to our panelists. And before I can open it up to the floor for questions, I think I have a few questions here for the members on the panel. And first and foremost, I'd like to apologize to President Mahaya for breaking protocol, but I uh, kept calling him Dr. Mahaya. Apologies. Um, so my first question goes to Michelle. So Michelle, uh, at the AIDS conference in Durban, we had a, a great movement, which we think should be the same here for Melbourne. So if we had to do that, what do you think this conference should do to make that a reality? And also from the time I think I've heard you speaking, you've been talking a lot about the 1990 uh, that you're calling for. So what can we do to reach that, as well as ensuring that uh, all people living with HIV and AIDS have undetectable levels? I think it's a very uh, important question. Again, uh, I will probably surprise you but uh, I don't believe that uh, the movement in Durban is the movement in Melbourne. If we want to continue with the same movement, we will completely lose the opportunity, and I said historical opportunity, to project ourselves in the future. What we need today is a, a movement which can take from here to year, not just the movement for AIDS. We need to be able to build the bridge between uh, AIDS movement with the women movement, with the TB movement, with, uh, uh, I can say, network of uh, sex workers, network of people who inject drugs. All those movements need to start uh, coming and converging and working for putting people at the center of the approach. That movement will certainly be capable to generate a new demand, a new different pressure to a policy maker, to a politician, to be able to certainly request the change we want to have, which is probably making sure that we can achieve, for example, the goals you're talking about, 1990-90. And this goal, I'm, I want to be very clear. Uh, Mark was talking about private sector, government investment, and others. 1990 is uh, primarily about saving life of people. It's to make sure that, uh, uh, for me, the ultimate goal of any successful effort in public health is to save life. That should be our ultimate goal. The rest, we can talk about coverage, we can talk about whatever, and that is very important. But if at the end we don't save life, uh, we are not winning. So for me, 1990 will be a reality if we are capable to bring those people who are around the table plus private sector. Why? The first 90, how you will be able to really reach today 90 people, 90% uh, 90 of people tested. It will not be possible without innovation. It will not be possible without transforming our health system approach. It will not be possible without reinforcing community interface with a service provider. So the role of communities will be certainly critical for creating demand. The private sector to help us to bring new tools, which will be certainly less costly, which will be friendly, which will help us to go uh, 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 towards communities and reach them, and moving from blood to fluid testing, so many. And that cannot be happening without this uh, possibility to bring uh, people who are uh, bringing resources, people who are taking decisions, community and innovation, so science, technology, and private sector. For me, that's one. Secondly, if you have 90% uh, of your people tested, to put 90% uh, of people on treatment is again, you need to talk about all those barriers I was talking about. You need to make sure that uh, treatment cost is going down. Uh, the uh, drugs 
is uh, long-acting drugs will come. You change completely the nature of uh, uh, the service delivery you're having to make sure that uh, uh, you don't have this person coming every uh, two weeks or every week to take the drugs, but we will have one injection every six months, probably, which will help to change completely the dynamic. That is very important because it will be certainly less toxic, it will be certainly uh, creating more adherence, it will help us to really reach. So that will not happen without also working with, again, private sector, working with pharma, working with research groups, trying to rethink completely. And the last one, suppression, uh, viral load suppression, is the same. Yesterday, I was uh, calling for uh, a reduction of the price, trying to make sure that we have a different tool, going to the community levels, make sure that it could be managed by them. So, to be honest, it is a revolution. It is a revolution in terms of uh, making, emerging a new partnership between the different uh, uh, part of this old system which uh, have been working in some way in isolation. And if we manage to do that, I'm convinced that we'll be able to achieve this 1990-90. And if we achieve 1990-90, is one part. Like I said, this should be uh, also, it's not enough. We need to have the same ambitious uh, a, a target for prevention, and we need to define that, and we need to be able to go to General Assembly uh, to l make sure that the world is coming with a more comprehensive target, and that is my objective. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Michel. Now a question for President Mohaye. As time to agree on the post-2015 agenda draws closer, how can we create political incentives for renewed leadership to ensure that the agenda includes a commitment to ending AIDS and that its leadership is maintained to make ending AIDS in Africa a reality? We have to actively remind them of their duty to us as citizens. They are going to go to the UN. All we need to do is, in all our countries, send delegations to our leaders to say that they should demand that AIDS be part of the 2015 agenda. Because the MDGs ending in 2015 have not been completed. That's not impossible. It, it, all they need to do is to agree among themselves to speak with one voice and demand it. I don't see how they can be ignored if they do, do, if they do so. The other thing is that I think they can undertake to reduce mother-to-child transmission to less than 1%, to 1% in the next three, five years because it's possible to do so. Again, it's within their, their ability to do so. And I am speaking as an African leader. I'm aware of our financial constraints. But surely no national priority could be greater for a national leader than the preservation of the lives of his people. <laughs> Therefore, in spite of our constrained budgetary situations, we could still at least increase our contribution to the, to the AIDS budget of our nations. I'm not, I'm not saying that some of our budgetary challenged countries are not serious, but for the world to, to continue to take it serious, we have to be seen to be giving adequate weight, adequate priority to the age budget. In a number of our countries, all, over six of them, 
93% of the aid budget comes from outside. Now, I'm not saying they are do, doing it deliberately, but surely they could reduce it from 93% to baby 90. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I want to be realistic. Uh, some, some of the countries face genuine problems. But, they, but even they too can. The other day at the African Development Bank, I pointed out that sometimes, for instance, in our countries, we have a thing called security. And we allocate resources to security. It's not always clear to me who's security. Uh -huh. mm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that they should abandon security. <laughs> but they could make security share resources with prevention of mother-to-child transmission. I said it at the ADB. There were uh, half a dozen heads of state there when we were in, in a panel. Uh, and I, I believe that, that it can be done. Some of the other countries can do more, much more. But I'm not saying that every country can do, can do as much, but they can do more than they're doing now. That, that's the other. You know, the other thing is that when we went around with the, my other colleagues in the Champions for an HIV-free generation, the other presidents, we met children who are young people who were about 18, 19, 20, who said that they were never told by their parents where they are taking tablets. They, they heard from other students say, hey, you. You are HIV positive, that's why you take tablets like this every day. And nobody is engaging these children. They are now 18, 19, 20, 21, becoming sexually active. They need somebody to hold their hand. Those are some of the things, refinements that maybe you are talking about, which could also, we, we should be, a, engage. So those are some, a few of, some of the things that I, I think we could do. We could increase our contribution to our national HIV budget. We could uh, really go and speak with one voice, uh, include HIV as in the post-2015 agenda, and also demand continuation of the global fund. But for us to be credible in that demand, we must be seen to be attaching importance to aid in our own national budget. Mm. That would authenticate our demand if we were to do that. Thank you, President Mohaya. I, I do agree with you, especially on the part of uh, children living with HIV and AIDS who are now teenagers whose parents don't tell them. In the communities where I work, like back home in Zambia, we also have a problem of, you know, it's really painful when a child is not told by the parents. The disclosure is not done by the parents, but by the friends at school. It's really painful, and I think that's one area where we should look at. I think before I turn to, uh, to Yvonne, maybe, Michelle, you can uh, talk a little bit about the domestic funding and the budget, just a little bit before I turn to Yvonne. Budget after uh, my big brother is very difficult. But what I want to say also, I think uh, we have been seeing change also happening. You know, the first report I submitted to African leaders was uh, four years back where I was uh, analyzing the dependency crisis of all the African countries one by one and putting them uh, and almost uh, 90 98% of the countries were dependent to only two sources, PEPFAR and Global Fund. And uh, when uh, we, I have been invited to come to NEPAD uh, to address the head of state, so I made the presentation to them, and I tried to explain that they are facing two major crises. One is funding, and uh, the risk to put millions of people on uh, treatment and, uh, and being not able to sustain that one. Secondly, 
I showed them also that the second dependency was uh, the potential crisis of commodities. Medicine, almost uh, 85 to 90 percent those days of uh, medicine were coming from India, thanks to India, but uh, it is not also sustainable. So those two uh, issues have been addressed uh, partially, and I agree with uh, President Moai that uh, we need to continue to push our leaders. And he was amongst the first those days already uh, to have almost 80 percent of uh, response finance from his budget. But today we saw in uh, less than four years an increase by 150 percent the domestic fund from Africa. So it's something which is happening. 150 percent. A country like uh, uh, South Africa was completely dependent, almost, of uh, mm -hmm. uh, foreign uh, uh, resources. Today, they are putting $2 billion, $2 billion from their national budget. They are the second national, uh, the highest uh, national uh, 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 investment on HIV AIDS in the world. Mm. So $2 billion. Things are changing, and uh, I can give you countries by countries in Africa today where internal resources, domestic, are coming. And globally, to talk uh, globally, for the first time, out of the $19 billion which we have been able to mobilize globally uh, for fighting HIV AIDS uh, last year, for the first time, we have 53% uh, coming from domestic resources not coming from donors. So for the first time, the resources coming from domestic resources are uh, more than donors' fund. So it's very important to share that one also with the donors, like Mark was saying, because those two lines are important, showing that we are transforming our response by owning progressively our response, but we are also in this uh, a vision of a shared responsibility, but also showing that infection are going down. I think those two mm -hmm. together can continue to maintain external uh, uh, funding uh, to the fight against HIV AIDS. But I wanted just to add that because we are seeing this change coming also. Uh, thank you, Michelle. It's good to know that our countries are also putting in uh, co-financing. So to- I, I want to make a, Go ahead. Uh, an explanation. When I said that our countries could increase the, uh, reduce their dependence, yeah. I said they could reduce their dependence from 93 to 90. <laughs> I, I, I was trying to be, I, I'm, well, I meant to be realistic. I, 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 I was, I'm afraid that may, you might have understood me to be saying that they could increase their contribution to 90%. No, 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 no. no. I'm not saying that. Okay. Uh, that is impossible. Yeah. Okay. I was saying that even if a country is at present currently dependent on external sources up to 95%, mm. it is worth an effort of increasing, reducing that to 93 okay. or reducing it to 90. Mm. That would still be a significant effort. That would still authenticate that country's voice in saying that it needs help. Thank you for the clarification. Uh, Yvonne, as you said, I think when we started uh, your presentation that at the Bangkok AIDS conference in 2004, Nelson Mandela said we cannot win the fight against HIV if we do not uh, tackle TB. Everybody knows that you're one of uh, Nelson, uh, late Nelson Mandela's uh, favored Daughters of Africa. What are you, in your, on your uh, personal level, doing to ensure that his legacy on TB will be achieved? Well, for the fact that I'm here today instead of going around the world and singing. <laughs> <laughs> but I really think it is important, you know, uh, Michelle and, and, uh, and, and the president and Mark, they've said it. I think it's important that our governments as well, you know, uh, in Abuja, they promised 15% of health. How many countries are putting their money? Banks will not give you money if you don't have collateral. That is important. 
Money from donors, it's very good, but we all know that when money comes, it has got frills, it has got conditions, and we have to know that. We have to invest in our people, and I think the most important thing, really, we have to talk about it. It's important. When money from donors comes, it has to go to the people. It has to be used appropriately. It does not have to go to the Swiss bank, ladies and gentlemen. It does not need to go into your pockets or buying big cars. We have to talk about this. Now, as an advocate, I want to make sure that our governments are, ho are held responsible. And I'm very happy that my MEC for Health is here today. Wazulu Natal, um, please do stand. He's my boss. But now I'm sitting on the podium, boss. Wazulu <laughs> Natal, we know that there's a lot of, of HIV, but we've seen a lot of work being done. And I'm actually very proud that South Africa does put man, money to the Global Fund, Mark. Mm. We, we, we put money in the Global Fund. So if governments can know that uh, they are there as leaders and uh, they have to do things for their own people, it becomes very important. And there can never be another Nelson Mandela. There was just one man mm. who tackled the bull by the horn, stood very firm and worked for other people and did it self selflessly and selfishlessly, wanting to help other people. So I want to walk in this great man's footsteps. I know I can never be him, but just emulate good. It all starts with you and then you can spread it to other people. Our youth are very important. If we don't do it now, it's going to be a vicious cycle. And let's do it for the sake of our children and our women. Thank you, Yvonne. And last but not the least, uh, two quick questions to Mark. Mark, how do delivery systems need to be modernized if we are to end AIDS, TB, and malaria? And the last one is, how will the Global Fund ensure that communities, as well as civil society, are involved in the design, as well as the monitoring and evaluation, accountability of the post-2015 agenda? And for this, we're talking about doing this at every level to make sure that this time, the goals that will be chosen will be delivered. <laughs> Easy questions. <laughs> so, um, Innovation and delivery systems. Um, I, I, you, it's really a cascade, uh, whether it's prevention, care, or treatment. You start with uh, planning, and then you get to delivery and innovation at each step of the way. And each intervention actually has a different cascade. But there are some fundamental pieces uh, that we, we have to get right. Um, and really, it's uh, a similar trajectory. I mean, if you're looking at moving from a fragile state to a self-sufficient state, what are the things that are necessary? Uh, and then those are the delivery systems that you need to have in place. And basic ones are monitoring and evaluation systems, procurement and supply chains, financial management systems, logistics and communication systems. Um, uh, um, and those are things that need to be in place. Uh, to just emphasize a few, and we've developed an innovation hub around them, mainly because for the Global Fund's commitments, there are areas that are absolutely essential to support countries uh, to achieve um, uh, for their long-term sustainability are financial management systems, things that we don't talk about a lot because they're so, from a lot of public health people's perspectives, boring. But if you don't have a financial management system in place, you cannot possibly efficiently use resource. And the private sector is quite good at this. So a number of banks are actually partnering with us to, to build capacity not only of uh, public sector, but actually uh, community sector as well, uh, financial management systems. <clears throat> a second, which is particularly uh, important for an institution like the Global Fund, where two billion of the four, approximately four billion we uh, support countries with a year goes for commodities, is the, the procurement and supply system. And again here, um, we've not spent enough time focusing on best practice and really what the private sector does well, uh, which is get drugs, commodities to the right place, to the right people on time. We've actually done rather well, and by we I mean the countries. I mean, all we do is support the countries to get commodities to port. We've not done particularly well to then get them to the distal sites, particularly when you're getting out of cities, all in many places, even in the cities. And here again, the supply system is something the private sector does uh, rather well. 
Same in procurement. Um, we've had a struggle for the past 10 years between pooled procurement, which reduces prices and makes things available uh, in, a, in a forecasted way, uh, and country ownership. And we don't want to remove country ownership. Countries have to own their procurement. But with modern technology, we can actually build a system that countries can choose to use through their own procurement mechanism to access the lowest possible price, including for delivery. Um, and the way to think of that is Amazon.com, for those of you who use it. Uh, we can do that for procurement, and we're actually now partnering to develop the software with support of, um, of uh, uh, some foundations. Uh, and the reason that's important is it's not just, if you do an open source mechanism like that, anyone can use it. So it's not limited to HIV, TB, and malaria. Hepatitis can use it, hypertension, diabetes. It's an open source mechanism. And if you do similar things for supply systems, it's really important. Linking to what Michelle was talking about, drug security, uh, which is very important, um, you know, supply and distribution systems would create thousands or tens of thousands of jobs in every country. Um, and that's something that the private sector, I think, will have strong interest in investing in, including the African Development Bank. So again, sustainability with delivery around financial management and um, supply and procurement systems. And the last is quality of programs, which is a huge uh, bucket. But again, it gets to the cascade. And one thing we've done, again, is look at averages and look at national approaches rather than system by system, country, uh, program by program. Botswana, I've seen programs where they have viral suppression at greater than 90% uh, at two years. But then you'll go to a clinic not too far from that one that's at 30 or 50%. So what's the difference and how do you assure the equality? And it's not just for treatment. It's true for prevention. It's true for identifying and keeping key affected population and services. Some people do extremely well at that. So it's really looking at um, quality in each of the key nodal points that prevent delivery uh, from occurring. And this, these are just a few key ones. Um, uh, in terms of ensuring civil society, there is going to be a tension. I do think we need to be cognizant of it between increased domestic finance and engagement of civil society. And we need to be recognizing that today and engaging in it. It's hardly the responsibility of the Global Fund. We do, as a partnership and as one that involves civil society and is trying increasingly to ensure the active involvement of civil society and uh, community organizations, not only in monitoring and evaluation, but actually in delivery because they do it rather well, in innovation, in seeing the health system is not ending at a clinic. Because if you're going to reach hard to reach groups, the only ones that are going to do it is the community. Um, but as the public sector, because domestic finance increases, becomes more engaged, we need to ensure that there's a recognition that the health system extends well beyond the clinic. And the Global Fund will do its piece through our country dialogues, but really our country dialogues are UNAIDS and WHO and all the bilateral programs. It's not us, it's actually all of us. And so I'd end there the way I actually started when you asked a question about the Global Fund. It's actually all of us. I mean, everyone in this room is the Global Fund. You know, we have 600 people in Geneva. Uh, the Global Fund was built as a 21st century partnership. So it's everyone getting involved. And we're going to need to pay attention to the keeping community at the center, uh, particularly as domestic finances increase and the public sector uh, becomes more and more active. Thank you very much to all the panelists. I'll now open the uh, floor for questions. I'll take uh, maybe three questions at a time. So we have the mics out there. Yes, yes please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Thank you to, um, sorry for my voice. Thank you to the, all the speakers. It's always an honor to, to listen to Mark and Michelle. Um, my question are both, to both of you. Um, you just heard that the announcement of a $10 billion, $100 billion development bank. You all know that new technologies, cost effective. We, we cannot hear you. Sorry, um, sorry my voice is gone. Uh, my, is the microphone. <laughs> uh, we've just heard that there's a $100 billion BRICS development bank that has been recently announced. Uh, considering the fact that uh, um, BRICS countries obviously are very cost effective, innovations coming up genetics coming up, treatment, cost care, effectiveness, everything's quite coming up from the BRICS nations. I just want to ask Michelle, what's the UNA strategy to work closely with the BRICS Development Bank? Can HIV, TB, malaria be formulative as a part of the BRICS Development Bank agenda? What's UNA doing on it? And Mark, my question to you is, what do you see the future, um, specifically with Global Fund, 
Absolutely, considering all of us being here with you, um, working closely with BRICS Development Bank. Is it a possibility, is it to them, is it possibility they can, you can work together? Thank you. Uh, let me take all the four questions because we're running out of time. We've only got five minutes. So please make your questions short. So I'll only take to, uh, questions from the four that are up. Can I take from you? And then the gentleman um, at the back and there. Thank you very much. And thank you for the very inspiring um, um, sub, um, presentations. I have um, comments more than questions. My first comment is, um, in my opinion, um, one of the very critical things, which was sort of mentioned at the end, but I was a bit disappointed that there was no common thread amongst the speakers, was the issue of health system strengthening. And I think, in my opinion, um, we will end HIV once we strengthen our, 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 our health systems. And I think that's very important. What we have seen with this um, disease-focused you know, kind of um, approach is that it actually weakens the health systems. I'm going to be controversial and say a lot of um, a lot of money, a lot of the resources that have been put into HIV, AIDS um, in the last decade, um, last 15 years, have actually weakened some of our you know public health interventions um, and and health systems quite significantly. And I think that's where we actually should be starting. We we've already identified in this conference. We've got the science. We've got the budgets. Um, uh, we've got the legal frameworks in most of our countries, but what is lacking is a, a very strong and robust system to carry this through. Okay, thank you. And another thing I just wanted to mention was um, uh, um, the issue of people. I think we have left the people behind. Mm. I think we speak about health, uh, you know, people-centered approaches, but it's, it's largely lip service that we're paying to these things. There's very little, there's recognition that there's a lot of social cultural barriers and drivers of HIV infection, mm. and, yet, and yet we don't talk a lot, we don't engage enough with our communities, and I think that's problematic. Okay, and just you. because of the brilliant presentation by uh, President Mohai, I I also just want to mention, I'm also speaking from the perspective of, a, of an African, I am an African, and I think we do have a problem on the continent. I think there's very little it by way of local leadership. Uh, we come to these big international conferences, we make this noise, and the truth is when we go back home, I come from South Africa, mm. when we go back home there's very little we can do unless we we duplicate this, we have something similar on a smaller okay. scale, you okay. know, uh, where we can have a more intimate dialogue with our policymakers, with our, I'm glad we, we even have an MS, MEC of health here, where we can have a more intimate dialogue around these issues and okay. see how we can take them forward at country level. All Thank right. you. Thank you very much. The gentleman at the back. Um, yeah, um, I'm very shocked, actually, that Mark and Michelle, you haven't mentioned the church. We're providing 50% of the health care in sub-Saharan Africa. We have some of the best viral load suppressions, the best retention, and yet we're still at 5% of the global fund. And with the exception of Zambia and Malawi, it's almost impossible to get our health systems in with the government. What, what are we going to do? Thank you. The gentleman... Uh, I'm uh, uh, Dr. Ashok Agarwal from India. I have been work, I work with FHI 360. And I've been working on HIV AIDS for almost 20 years now. And it's very heartening to hear this target of ending HIV AIDS by 2030. But uh, uh, I have two observations. One, uh, the ending AIDS seems to be a kind of misnomer, as we have already said. What we mean is control of AIDS. But in, think about the lay people. The general message which people will think ending AIDS means like ending polio. It's not like that. And uh, uh, second thing which I think is the target seems to be very, very ambitious at this point of time. Uh, even if I think of only my country, which is India, there are a lot of variations. We have very poor, uh, very challenging, let me say very challenging health system. We have people who are very poor, less than uh, almost 30% of people are uh, below the poverty line. We have other competing uh, priorities like nutrition, diarrhea, and millions of children dying because of all that. We have so much of tension around that we spend, uh, end, of spend, end, end up spending so much of money on okay. defense rather than, than on health. Okay. And Thank also you. what I see is, in terms of science, uh, we still don't have vaccine to prevent HIV. Unless uh, we get things like that, 
then what happens is even if in, in developed countries where we see the epidemic is uh, low, the incidents are low. Why? Because there is so much of money which is being spent on it. So okay, even thank, if we reach the target much. of control, we still would have would need to spend a lot of money in keeping mm -hmm. that epidemic under control. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The last question. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Marie from Humana, People to People. I just want to commend President Mohaye for the incredible leadership he has provided for Africa in the fight against AIDS. Uh, our organization has worked at the community level, mobilized millions of people in sub-Saharan Africa, including Botswana, hand in hand with uh, the government of Botswana, with the Global Fund, with PEPFAR, etc in the entire region. Uh, I want to come back to the question of 1990-90. Uh, to, to reach the first 90, uh, we know, and I think all of us in this room knows, that in order to get control of the epidemic, the people need to be in the center, and they need to be empowered and take control of the epidemic. Mm. Uh, one of the things to reach 90% tested will require field testing. It will require massive amounts of field officers going from house to house to actually test people and get them into treatment. Okay, and my you. question is, what do we need to do differently? And this is a question to the panel as a whole, to work together with you to mobilize that additional resources that is absolutely needed to reach that goal. Thank you very much. Um, I think each of the panelists can take a question and answer as a way of also wrapping up. Thank you. Now, um, my point will be very quick. First, uh, reacting on my sister from South Africa. I think uh, we have uh, generalization is very dangerous uh, from my point of view because uh, uh, the field experience is giving us a different uh, uh, message. If you take, uh, for example, uh, uh, Ethiopia, they use AIDS money to train uh, 38,000 uh, community health workers, to change completely the si delivery system, to um, manage to really uh, reach communities with uh, those health workers, and even create a subsystem of uh, uh, health, which helped them to reduce during the last uh, four years by 90% the HIV infection. Rwanda did the same. So I think I can give you different examples like that where the AIDS resources has not been just vertical but has been helping to uh, reinforce, but Mark can give you more information. Second point on uh, uh, a new BRICS fund. I think it's very important before leaving this room to not forget that uh, we will have uh, in uh, 10 years minimum, mac uh, maximum, 10 years from now, we'll have 87% of the people living with HIV living in middle-income countries. If you don't put that in your perspective, you will miss completely the whole debate. We will have only 13% of people living with HIV in low-income countries. That will change completely the paradigms of financing, paradigm of partnering, paradigm of uh, global fund, and uh, how we'll work in the future. So uh, the BRICS, engaging the BRICS is critical. Yesterday, you heard me talking about BRICS, uh, also uh, G20 and also uh, uh, private sector because I personally believe that in the future this paradigm will be central. Uh, you cannot do it uh, without engaging them because uh, I said 87% of people living with HIV will not be anymore in Mali. In, uh, they will be in uh, uh, middle income countries. So what will be the nature of uh, uh, ODA, uh, AIDS, and resource uh, to be used there. That's very important. Uh, I, I think uh, we need also, before leaving here, uh, to respond to our colleague that from India. I fully agree. All these obstacles, challenge, we know. It's a pity that I said that to India, that you are giving, uh, you are producing medicine, and Botswana has 90% of coverage. You have 33% of coverage on treatment. 
So I, I, I know your medicine is coming in Botswana to make 90% there, uh, almost 90% in South Africa and 30% in uh, India. We need to change that. That is a governance issue. It's uh, fundamental. But that is not a problem of uh, being uh, not ambitious or ambitious. When people told us in uh, 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 General Assembly in 2001, and Mark remember very well, and I said to Mark, please don't say it strongly like you used to say. Uh, people were just, uh, they stand up in there by saying that we cannot give a treatment to poor people. We cannot give treatment to Africans. It's impossible how we will treat them. They will not even able to uh, 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 properly follow the protocol and drug is too expensive. Today we're talking about almost 14 million people being treated. So ambitious target is important. When we decided to have 15 million people treated by 2015, just a few years back, it was only 8 million. They told me, you're completely crazy. We have only 300,000 people treated every year, additional treated every year. How you can reach uh, uh, 15 million? We are 14 million and we'll reach 15 million. In the last uh, three years, we put 5.6 million people on treatment. It was uh, what we did last uh, three years is equivalent of what we did last 25 years. So I think progress are coming, things or innovation is coming, we have challenges, we need to deal with those challenges, but it's very important to really pick that. I, I want to stop there and our colleague there. Yes, I think, yes uh, thank you. Maybe just quick uh, uh, concluding remarks. I think we've run over time. Yes. Sorry. Uh, President Mai. Sorry. Before I leave here, I want an explanation from Michelle. I have read that you, you, you say that a certain percentage of people living with the virus will be in middle-income countries yes. and not in the poor countries. Will that be because there is a faster rate of new infections in middle-income countries or some middle, some poor countries will become middle income. You are a good economist. I know you are better <laughs> economist than me. <laughs> I think Thank most you. of the countries will be graduated as a, a, a middle income countries. That is the major challenge we'll have to face. But at the same time, we will have a major a social issues, major health issues, major. Is, so, what will be the dynamic of the partnership? We need to start thinking about that. Thank you. Thank you. But the other point is that I wanted to say that I don't think my sister from South Africa is entirely wrong. <laughs> no, After all, in, in, uh, you remember when we were in Malawi, and to some extent when we were in London, in the, yes. the, the other Lancet. commission, in the Lancet Commission, it was admitted that to some extent we did uh, neglect some aspects of our health services while we were pursuing AIDS. Uh, so there is an element of truth in what she's saying. But you are right, it doesn't apply to every country. But in the majority of cases, we did become preoccupied with, um, with, with, with AIDS and, and, and some aspects of the health systems suffered as a result. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to say that she's not. But finally, some other people in different contexts, when we are talking about integration, they asked me, if China was 53 countries like Africa, would it be dominating the world as it is today? If India was 53 independent countries, would it be dominating the supply of, of um, what do you call them? RIV. Uh, no, but they are, what are they called when they are generic not? Uh, generic drugs. Generic drugs. Yes. And they said that just only be the failure of, there is Mo Ibrahim, who, who you know, one, one of the scientists contributed to the creation of the cell phone. He also said, Africa is the, has had the fastest consumption of cell phones, but because it's 53 different countries, it has not been able to arm twist any manufacturer to locate in Africa because of the failure of Africa to integrate. Because we are 53 individual countries, 
in the aggregate so far as um, cell phones are concerned, uh, our rate of consumption has been higher than that of anybody else, but yet we import everything because we are fragmented. But maybe we should note that too. Okay, thank you. Anything, <laughs> yes. <laughs> If there's anything burning, uh, Mark, Yvonne? Just I just, um, I couldn't tell, but I, by the height, I'm guessing it's Father Rick. I'm not sure, but um, um, I thought I did talk about the church and the imams and the, the mosques because I've talked about the community, and I believe the faith-based organizations are part, a deep part of the community, and that we can't get to where we need to be without full engagement of the community. And the faith-based sector is one of the most important for that. Financing is a different issue, and that's why I raised the specter that as we have more and more domestic finance uh, and more decision making in the public sector, we need to keep reminding that we will not get to where we need. We cannot control the epidemic without the deep involvement of every part of the community, including the faith sector. Yvonne? As we well, I think I did speak about the one-stop shop. For me, a one-stop shop, it's strengthening the health systems because a woman cannot go one minute here for pap smear or for mammogram or so we need to include everything i think it's important that we integrate everything okay so thank you very much thank you to our panel thank you everyone for coming